one third of the UK's population will soon be drawing their pension. With time in their hands and less money in their pockets, a growing number of the over 60s are not spending their sunset years at the tea dance. Retired wing commander, 71, caught with a car full of drugs. Growing old, disgraceful. A ruthless band of magpie Scots grannies go on the rampage. The elderly widow then sold grave drugs to Michael teenagers twins, from a trendy in Edinburgh. Old the grandmother trade. claimed that 55,000 cigarettes were for her own. 78-year-old granny is Britain's oldest bootlegger. Already the first ripples of a grey crime wave are starting to show. Law-abiding citizens, sometimes armed with more than their bus passes, are beginning to stray off the straight and narrow. I will never admit that I'm a bank robber. How can I rob somebody who's robbed me? I was happier with checkbooks and cards, but I also did do um, credit cards. Would you describe yourself, Charlie, as a bit of an old rogue? No, that's a, that's, that's, that's a stupid name, really. That, that is a stupid name, an old rogue. I would say I was a successful fucking bank robber. Retirement, British style. A time to relax and indulge in the activities you've always loved. For some, becoming a pensioner has also brought completely new and unexpected experiences. Please have my fingerprints now. It's something I would have never thought I'd have to ever give them. I wouldn't have minded doing the community service and paying the fine if the lawyers have the tobacco as well. I, I knew it was, it was wrong, I, but uh, I thought, well, a little man like me, not bother much, you know, but I was wrong. <laughs> the combination of jolly jaunts to the continent and the rising cost of cigarettes has made smuggling one of the more popular pensioner pastimes. Tempting even law-abiding men and women into the criminal underworld. Oh, it is good fun. I used to like going. Going over to France and having a ride over there and coming back, you know. We used to go winter winter time and summer time and it was it was it was right nice, especially summer. Probably if I hadn't got caught, I'd have still been going, you know what I mean? I'd be fair. Customs and Excise estimate that smuggling cost £2.5 billion in lost revenue last year. On pension, there's loads of them. I mean, disabled people doing it with sticks and can hardly walk. There's one particular man and woman, they live in Dover. They go every day, three or four times a day, but they're only on the boat. They go across in the morning, cross and get the duty free on the boat when you could buy more than one carton, get the duty free, then come back and get your duty free, get off boat when it gets into Dover, there's a taxi waiting there, they hand him them, get back up boat, go back on the same boat again, come back, they do four and five trips a day. It does seem as though all sorts of pensioners are taking up smuggling, even war veterans. What a judge would later describe as a dishonest cooperative of 17 old soldiers in Wakefield were counting the cost of cigarettes. Down at the club, we got together and we said, right, we're going to do something about it. We're going to go out and we're going to save ourselves some money. Because we'd worked it out on the amount that we consumed in the course of a year compared to British costs we were going to say something like 600 quid a piece. Now, all right, we'll get a minibus up. That was the first idea we got. I said, well, there's only one snag with a minibus. If there's 17 of us in a minibus, where are we going to put the tobacco? <laughs> so Kenneth, leaving his old comrades at the club and carrying their £5,000 in his back pocket, went to France conveniently ignoring the excise duties personal release order of 1992. 
But smuggling is not the only activity the criminally inclined pensioner can turn their hand to. They're also partial to a bit of check fraud and embezzlement, sometimes in the strangest places. Who'd have thought a genteel, well-endowed charity promoting the welfare of trees would have harboured a major fraudster? Bunty McSkimming, now in her 70s, Sunday school teacher, girl guide leader, and for 13 years, the loyal, efficient secretary of the Glasgow Tree Lovers Society. Bunty McSkimming was a fairly domineering person, to be honest. I, I used to be kind of frightened of her at one point because um, she would get you to do things that you didn't want to do. <laughs> she wore a hat. A big fluffy blue hat and a hair. She had that sort of kind of a churchy look about her. She was a shrewd smoking granny. I personally didn't take to the woman at all because she, she wasn't like a tree lover. She was of a different... <laughs> A variety, a different specimen. While some of the tree lovers may have felt Bunty didn't quite fit in, she was trusted. When she offered to take over as the charity's treasurer, the tree lovers were all thrilled. No one questioned her motives in volunteering for so tedious a job. There were over £80,000 in the society's funds, roughly £1,700 of which was in current account. There was over £40,000 on money market and the rest in treasury stock. Just three weeks after taking over as treasurer, Bunty McSkimming quietly went to work. On blank cheques signed in advance by trusting colleagues, Bunty started emptying the tree lover's account. She charmed these other ladies. And when she asked, would you sign this cheque, because I don't know just how much money for such and such, they did so. £100, £600, £1,000. Initially, the amounts were not huge, but why would anyone suspect that nice old lady from Tree Lovers of doing anything wrong? You don't really connect a woman of that age with thieving. And this is wrong because it doesn't matter what age you are, you can be a thief at any age. The trouble is many of the new breed of bus pass criminals don't see themselves as thieves. Despite the regularity of Bernard's trips abroad, he maintained a sense of innocence about what he was doing. Did you think when you were going to France that you were breaking the law? No, did I? Yeah, I didn't know. No, no, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it at all. Just going over there, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, just, just going and just getting a few cigarettes and one thing or another and coming back home again. We used to work, just used to do it for a couple of days. Uh, you know, it was interesting, really. We didn't think we would have gotten into trouble for it. How long were you doing it, Bernard? Well, three, four years. <laughs> I went a lot of times, I know. I did. How many cigarettes were you bringing back, do you think, on each trip? Oh, probably 10,000, 8,000. Depends what you could get, you know. So you can get what you want, but coming home, you then have customs. And that's where a lot of people come unstuck. And we got off at half past two in the morning, and there's about 12 police cars and customs officers. And they interviewed us from five o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock at night. When they took me in to question me, they discussed them fellow and this woman into PlayStation and they had taped it all, what I'd said, you know. And this fella, when he got in there, it, it was all, took his coat off and then this thing off. I says, what's that? He said, it's a bulletproof vest. I said, what do you wear that for? He said, in case you decided to have a go at me. I said, oh, it's a pretty stupid crackers. Bulletproof vest. They want a bulletproof breast, they do that. If I had my way, I'd line them all up. Charles Cowden's been in quite a few lineups. 
He's been a thief all his life and is currently on probation. Born 83 years ago in Scotland, Charlie, alias Donald MacLeod, alias General John Keneally, also known as Bang Bang Charlie, has 579 convictions to his name. His crimes range from petty theft and deception all the way up to armed robbery, though the latter may be a little beyond him now. I think if I went into a bank today with a gun, I'd probably drop it. You see, when you go in a bank with a gun, your heart's going boom, boom, boom. My heart wouldn't take it. I'd probably drop it. I mean that, I probably would. I mean, I've had five heart attacks. Not one, two, three, four, I've had five heart attacks. And I've got one eye. I've got cirrhosis in my liver and my kidney through that, collapsed on the floor. And I've got this leg here. Otherwise, I'm fit. <laughs> Charlie's day-to-day -day life doesn't appear to differ that much from other pensioners. But old habits die hard, and it's not been that long since he showed his true colours. An elderly Romeo staged an armed hold-up at a building society. This is a raid. Get your hands up. Under his stocking mask, he looked so old, cashiers thought it was a joke. He sank to his knees, saying, find my heart. I've got a the heart The judge problem. said he was a retired professional con man who has taken to armed robbery in his sunset years. Have you ever had a proper job, Charlie? <laughs> Who's trying to do? Give me a heart attack. Proper job? <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> proper job. Nothing in it. No, no, proper job. Do you miss the thrill and excitement of your previous work? Oh, yeah, I miss it. Yeah, but I'm too old for that now, isn't I? Charlie has spent a lifetime cultivating and playing the part of the gentleman. But aside from his smart wardrobe, he doesn't appear to have any of the obvious trappings of wealth, or at least none he was willing to show us. Are you quite rich, Charlie? <laughs> yes, but I'm not telling you how much. I mean, where you live is a very modest council flat. Yes. There's millionaires that live in council flats. Don't be uh, thinking they're all poor people, they're bloody not. Rich or poor, Charlie has his own very specific banking arrangements. I don't have cards or checks. I've got safety deposit boxes. Have you got nothing, Charlie, or have you got a lot? You've asked me that so many times now, you're fishing, but you won't get nowhere because the cops have been trying for years to find my safety deposit. Now I'm getting ratty. Now you keep asking that question. Even the police don't know. Now, come on. If I told you, they'd be running there like a bloody shot. Now, come on, let's be fair about it. You're not interested as long as you get what you want. Now, I'm really getting annoyed now. As Charlie mellows in his old age, he can reflect on the fact that the geriatric armed robber is still something of a rarity. Far more common is the pensioner bootlegger, making a bob or two out of selling illicit cigarettes. Come on. Come on. In Gateshead, John Atkinson knew what he was doing was illegal. He just didn't think his small-scale black market operation would get him into trouble. And then he won the lottery. I won the lottery. I won just about two thousand pound a lottery. So I thought, well, I'll. Just go and buy some cigarettes and tobacco off somebody and sell it on. Everybody else is doing it, I might as well do it and then get a few bob. Way. I thought it was just the, like the drug barons and things that was naughty, you know, people that was bringing big trailer for us, you know, from other countries. But I mean, we weren't, we were just buying them off somebody else. You know, it's, it sounds naive, but at the time it just, you just think, oh, well, what's a few hundred fellas? So what made you, at 65, decide that it was OK to break the law when you'd never broken the law before? I couldn't tell you, that's it. Uh, just extra money. But you didn't, at the time, you didn't think you were breaking a law at the time, because there's, there's that many people are selling them, you know what I mean? So you say, well, is that breaking the law or not? I was only making about £2 on 200 cigarettes, which, if you think, is not a lot of money. 
I brought the carpet, sitting room carpet, and the stair carpet, you know, and the cooker. I mean, I didn't squander the money, you know. It wasn't such a big scale thing, you know. I thought to get caught, you had to be selling millions and millions and millions, you know. It just shows how stupid you can be. Another late entrant into the world of crime is Ivy Miller. She actively played in the fact she was an old lady, not the sort you'd associate with thieving. When people looked at me, they immediately thought of me as a grandmother figure and not the type of person that would be uh, committing fraud. When Ivy became a criminal at the age of 69, she was quite particular about what sort of crime she did. I wouldn't have done anything with drugs, and I wouldn't have done anything that involved pornography or young children. Banks and building societies were a different matter. Sid Cheney doesn't like banks and building societies either. Since his retirement, he's been waging a one-man war against the financial institutions of the high street. I've taken money from every one of the banks and building societies, and yet not one of them's got the guts enough to prosecute me and let me go on a platform in the court to explain why I, Sid Cheney, an old man, has done this thing. Sid maintains his thieving's not done for personal gain, but to ridicule the banks for the wrongs he believes they have done him. I don't regard myself as a thief. I expect some people would think that, and uh, I would be hurt if someone ever called me a thief to my face. really, a little bit. I didn't make a fortune out of it. I mean, probably I maybe make 10 or 15 quid a week, but I mean, it was it was 10 or 15 quid. It was paying me rent every, every week. You know what I mean? It's hard living nowadays. I mean, pension money's nothing. 73 pounds, something like that, and exact of a few pence or what have you. Then 20, 30, 40, 50, 55, 57, 59, Of course, it's a struggle. I can't see how any pensioner on the basic pension, single or married, can live an adequate life. I don't. Because the pension's been 82 pounds a week. My wife gets 42, so I reckon that up, it's not much to live on. I mean, I mean when you're used to working all your life, when you come 65 and that stops and you drop from 140 pound a week down to 84 pound a week, it's a lot of a drop, right, isn't it? Well, you get sick of having any money for a start. And my carpet was threadbare. And so, oh, and my cooker was just about on its last leg. I don't socialise now like I used to. Because we haven't got the money, you can't, how can you? You, you, you can not. Uh, you can't spend what you haven't got. Are you a law-abiding citizen? Well, I class myself as one. Up to two years ago, when I got involved with this little bit of trouble, I've lived a virtually honest life. There's only one person that I know that pays the full price for tobacco. So I'm positive that the majority of society doesn't think that what I did was wrong. They just turned around and said, hard luck that you were caught. Have you, Bernard, ever done anything illegal before? Illegal? No, no, I ain't, no, no. I <laughs> ain't no chance. I am, no. No, only apart from going to Dover, that's all like, you know, which cigarette job like. So you took to crime in your old age? Yeah, yeah, I have, I, it's a fact, yeah. I've never been in a court, I've never been in jail, I've never done no. I mean, I've had accidents with cars, you know, but that's... But, like, for stealing or selling anything like that, though, I've never been to court, no, I've been to my life. It just goes to show, if they catch you, they make you pay. But first, they have to catch you. Having emptied the tree lover's current account, Bunty McSkimming now set about getting her hands on the rest of their money. 
Within a few months, she had discovered that she could transfer funds by herself from the money market account into current account and thereafter continued to draw cheques. So, after 60 years of genteel inactivity, the tree lovers' banking habits changed radically. Money started moving around all over the place, and, as always, Bunty managed not to arouse anyone's suspicions. The other members of the council appeared to be totally unaware that funds were being transferred. Bunty McSkimming wasn't simply cashing cheques. She was also laundering tree lovers' money through the accounts of another charity, of which she just happened to be treasurer. I do believe that if the woman was short of money and she had gone to any of the senior members of Glasgow Tree Lovers and said that she was needing four or five thousand pounds, they would have given it to her. But it would appear that four or five thousand pounds was a little less than Bunty McSkimming had in mind. At the end of Mrs McSkimming's first year as treasurer, she had removed nine, over nine thousand pounds of the society's funds, four thousand pounds of it in cash, and £5,000 in cheque. So, £9,000 down, only £74,000 to go. Unlike Bunty, Sid Cheney didn't limit himself to just one bank account, or indeed one bank. He opened fraudulent accounts up and down the high street in the names of his now-deceased pets. Our first one was BJ Cameron. Uh, and that was a Border Colliery, and that was at, uh, the first one at Barclays Bank Camden Town Branch. There's Newman, which was Newing My Cat, and that was again Barclays Bank at King's Cross Branch. Stafford was a Bulldog, and I took that out at Barclays Bank Northampton Branch. Skeet was a Parrot, Mitchell was a Cat, Patrick was a Dog, Walter was a Budgerigard, that was at Nav West in the City Branch, London M1. Sid's secret weapon in conning the banks was playing on the fact he was a doddery old fool with money to invest. I used to go into the bank, let my walking stick fall to the floor. I say, well, um, I'd like to join your bank. They say, sir, um, are you sure that's what you want? I say, well, I've had this money so long, I keep hiding it, in old age, maybe, I keep forgetting where I'm putting it. I say, I want to put my money because there's robberies around where I am. It's only a small man. 20 or something like that, 20,000. What did you say, how much? I said, well, silence is golden. No, uh, so they say, well, Mr Skeet, shall we try you off with a card, first of all? And I said, what's these cards about? They say, well, we've got a master card and a Bartley card with little penguins on it. you like that, wouldn't you? Sid didn't just like them, he loved them. And he kept getting more and more running up huge bills, then defaulting on the payments. These were credit cards which I obtained from Barclays Bank. Defaulted at 2,500, 1,500. 1,600, defaulted at 1,500 Visa, the excess card. This time the MasterCard at 1,000. Sid maintains he isn't a thief because he gave away most of the money. But in his first foray into fraud, he ran up debts totalling an astonishing £117,000. Desperate for a platform for his campaign, Sid admitted his crimes publicly, but the banks chose not to prosecute. Sid, 80 this year, now lives in Essex. He learned as a serial fraudster that the one thing he couldn't do was stay too long at the same address. Sid has moved seven times in the last 10 years. You have to move house often because you, you want to do another account with another name. And you can't use the one because once you get naughty at one address, they put you on the debtors list. And so that's why I moved to a new address. Then I would start again. Sid's methods for getting himself moved on were as devious as his bank accounts were many. There was a bit of a fire. Somebody put a, scorched my front door. Then there was a brick thrown from my window. And I said, there's too many hooligans around here. So you did this all yourself to move you on? Yeah. But that one was at Brook House. I was on the 13th floor. I did fire, park this bank opposite, 5,000 pounds. 
And they were right on my doorstep. They kept pestering a bit, and I thought, but you better move this. So I got in touch with social services. They come and saw me. They said, but you just moved. You, you must be in a place for at least 12 months. You've only been here for eight or nine months. I said, doesn't matter. Don't worry about me. I've had my day. You look after somebody else. I said, when I go up at five o'clock in the morning, I look out the windows. It's all the little lights of Basden. I want to fly. Oh, they said, Mr. Tony, we must move you. I said, why? Do you have good fun planning all this? Yeah. Sometimes it comes spontaneous. <laughs> Shame it's all going to end. Like Sid, once Ivy Meller started doing check fraud in her 60s, she developed a taste for it. I think anybody who has actually been involved in checkbook fraud, if they're honest, will say that it gave them a buzz while they were doing it. It was lonely, and if I'm quite honest, it was exciting up to a point. There was always the uh, element of challenge in the air. Ivy's justification for her crimes was that she desperately needed the money to save her home. It wasn't what I wanted to do. It was the only avenue left to me because I'd tried all other legitimate means of getting out of my trouble. I think it was the only fraud that I was capable of committing with conviction. It's very, very easy. You've only got to have the ability to just sign a name. Do you think you became rather good at it? I think I became excellent at it, to be honest. <laughs> if you got a checkbook and card, if it was a full book, you'd need probably three days at it. Because at the end of the third day, it would be on a stolen list, wouldn't it? You see? So you have to work quite hard. Yes. It. On the other hand, sometimes you get a checkbook, it might only have five or seven in. So you do it in half a day. Ivy's less keen to address the question of where the checkbooks she was using came from and who they had belonged to. I didn't think about how it was acquired because I had nothing to do with that, you see. Was that sort of turning a blind eye a wee bit? I suppose it was turning a blind eye up to a point. Um, but I also knew that the, they wouldn't suffer a financial loss because the banks would be the people who would lose. Matters of conscience don't seem to be troubling Charlie's twilight years either, as he takes pleasure in the nicer things of life. Not self of my conscience. I ain't got no bloody conscience. Conscience, very conscience, you wind up skin. I was a young man, I couldn't give a shit how they felt. But I've said it many times since I've got on in, in years, what a traumatic fact for a girl to look up and she's got a bloody gun halfway through her. It's not a nice feeling, it can be a nice feeling. I wouldn't like it. Do you feel bad about it now? No, I don't feel bad about it. I don't feel bad about it. It's a bit late to feel bad when you've done it, isn't it? That's bloody hypocrisy, isn't it? I don't feel bad about it because nobody was injured. Nobody was shot. Nobody was hurt. They might have been mentally hurt. Well, there you are. There's plenty of quacks around to straighten them out, isn't there? As well as his own brand of morality, Charlie's also developed an interesting philosophy, which has allowed him to conclude he's really no different from everyone else. Everybody's out to make a dollar, you know. But they've got different ways of doing it. Different, some, some people have skin a bit off the office and all that carry on, but most people go out and work for a bloody living. But I'm afraid of work and I have never agreed very much. No, 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 not, not really. Oblivious to their deepening financial plight, the Glasgow tree lovers were now due their year-end accounts. 
trusted treasurer Bunting McSkimming, was to address the annual general meeting. Everyone looked forward to the AGM because it was quite a nice night. We normally had tea and buns, uh, little sort of ice cakes and things, which was all very, very pleasant. We expected a typed sheet, as we normally did, of the budget, how the money was working and such like. And uh, suddenly uh, we were handed round this handwritten sheet. Uh, it didn't look very professional at all, and it looked as though it would actually signed. We couldn't really recognise the signature too well. If any tree lovers did harbour reservations about Bunty's rather amateur-looking accounts, they were far too polite to take it any further. Some of the arithmetic was not just quite right, but that was explained. The auditors certainly were not the auditors approved by the previous AGM. That was also explained by Mrs McSkimming. The income and expenditure account showed what would be normal, expected, routine expenditure and income, whereas most of those transactions had not occurred and the other transactions were not reported at all. In fact, uh, it was largely a work of fiction. As Bunty had rightly calculated, what the tree lovers couldn't see wouldn't bother them. Pending one or two inquiries um, uh, about the accounts, the accounts were approved. After the AGM, she appeared to uh, gain some confidence and the volume of transactions and the amounts of the transactions uh, accelerated quite significantly. The tree lover's fate was now sealed. Emboldened by having fooled them all, Bunty went to work, showing an utter disregard for the fact that she was leaving behind her a very clear paper trail. Accountant Jim Anderson would doggedly track down every single transaction Bunty made in her two years as the tree lover's treasurer. At the beginning of January, there was just £25,000 left out of the original £84,000. She charmed these, um, the girls in the bank. They used to say, oh, it's you again. In the course of January, she seemed to decide to uh, make a determined effort to clear the rest of it out. The cheques were now for £5,000, £6,000, £11,000 until... There was a mere £17 or so left in the society's uh, coffers. She is not a poor old lady at all. It was embezzlement on a grand scale. You cannot allow someone to take that amount of money from your society and do nothing about it. Bernard Ibbotson was caught with nearly 7,000 cigarettes and three and a half kilos of rolling tobacco. He was accused by customs and excise of evading £10,972 in duty. When Kenneth Legg was stopped at Folkestone, he had £275 of rolling tobacco, 1,000 cigarettes, 300 cigarillos, 212 pints of beer and 4.7 litres of spirits. Customs estimated he had evaded import duty of £21,709. John Atkinson was found with £2,000 worth of cigarettes in his home. In court, he admitted that he'd been bootlegging for two years. Taking into account how long he said he'd been in business, Customs estimated John had evaded £54,000 in duty. He was sentenced to nine months in prison, the first time in 44 years of marriage John and Sheila had been apart. Even the barrister was shocked, you know. He said with it being his first offence and never ever been in trouble before, you know. And with him being in bad health, he, he thought maybe he would have just getting like a suspended sentence. Even the lad inside said, how long did you get? I said, nine months. For selling cigarettes in the back, I said, they couldn't believe it. Do you regret it? Aye, in a way, aye, aye, I do, you know, because uh, I would hit the gun back again, like, I did the thing. <laughs> Do you think it 
Kenneth was not sent to prison for smuggling. Instead, he was fined £300. The car he was travelling in was confiscated and he was sentenced to 180 hours of community service. Good morning, ladies. Are you well? I served the 180 hours community service with the help of the aged, uh, two half days a week. And I enjoy it. It gets me out of meeting people. These blue ones here, darling. The community service finished way back in summer and enjoyed it so much that I've stayed and I'm a volunteer. I was fined £500, confiscated my car and uh, on 12 months suspended sentence. That's what I'm on now. So I can't do anything wrong now to keep my nose clean now or else I go into jail. For Bernard, perhaps more than most, the loss of his smuggling trips to France has left a large hole in his now rather quiet life. I like going fishing. Something to do, really, you know. And you're not in mischief or anything, sat here, just, you know, I mean, what else can you do? I used to like going to France, but I can't go there. <laughs> Never mind. It's finished, we know. I can't get caught again. I mean, they keep wanting me to go and order some of lads for a ride, and I feel like going. But then if I get over there and I get tempted to bring a few fags back and I get pulled, I'm, I'll be in prison, so I, I can't, can't do it. Do you not want to go to prison? No, no, yeah. What would have happened to my poor little birds if I had to go in prison? No way. No, they frightened me off good and proper. Prison or the prospect of prison did not deter Ivy Meller. Ivy got nine months for her first check fraud offence. But no sooner was she released than she did it all over again. I'd been caught and I'd been to prison for something that I'd done wrong, admittedly, but for which I'd had no benefit. And I think that's the thing that weighed with me. But this time round, you wanted to make some money? Yes. But second time around, Ivy was caught and sentenced to two years. She lost the home she was trying to save. And though still married, she now lives apart from her husband. Will you ever live together again, do you think, as man and wife? That's a difficult one because he knows that I've said I won't do it again. But in his heart of hearts, can he accept that? Or does he think there's a possibility? Ivy's reconciliation with her husband was put on hold when, at the age of 73, she was convicted of check fraud for a third time. I regret having, having broken the law. I regret it. I do, in my heart of hearts, believe in law and order, strange as that may seem to anyone listening, but I do. I do. And yes, I do regret it. That's it. Get it on. Remorse has never been one of Charlie's strong points. From his council flat in Kilburn, he still proudly cultivates the aura of the flash gentleman crook. I've got studs, but the days of studs went out with Victoria. People don't wear bloody studs anymore. Only in a dinner suit, so yes. <laughs> Tied to match, the handkerchief to match, and one to match, and that's it. The hat to match, the shoes to match, and that's it. Charlie's not exactly Al Capone, but he has attempted some pretty big heists, the largest of which was an armed robbery of £271,000. Ten years for it, didn't I? They never got the money. So some people will say that six years and eight months is not worth that kind of money. I think it was. I think it was. It wasn't bad for that amount of money. Well, that's over a quarter million bloody pounds, isn't it? Charlie's particular method of cost-benefit analysis has led to him having an intimate knowledge of a large number of Her Majesty's prisons. Pendenville, filthiest jail in the bloody country. Wandworth a bit stricter. 
Camp Hill, Wakefield. I shouldn't have been there. I thought I was a first offender. Parkos. Oh, that's a shit all over the place there. And they sent me to Leeds. Oh, Jesus Christ, what a place that was. Leeds. <sighs> How many years have you spent in prison? Well, I would say probably 15, 16 years. You put it all together. Did there you, you like are. prison? Oh, don't talk ridiculous. Who likes prison, for Christ's sake? Now, you ask some bloody... For a woman of your intelligence, you ask some bloody daft questions. Who the fucking hell like... I'm scared you get me swearing now. That's when I'm angry. Despite his avowed dislike of prison, Charlie's been in another spot of bother. His latest charges were defrauding a lady friend of several thousand pounds and possessing a firearm. Before giving him a two-year suspended sentence, Judge Timothy King said, I will give you the benefit of the doubt that at long last you have given up your life of crime. Woe betide you if you offend again. Every week, much to his annoyance, Charlie now visits his probation officer, nearly 50 years his junior. And in Glasgow, eventually, Bunty McSkimming also had her day in court. Too late, though, for the tree lover's £84,000. Unbelievable. It actually did take a few days to sort of um, sink in. I was absolutely horrified because I'd worked for so many years to build it up. I just couldn't believe that she had managed to clear the account out. In court, Bunty pleaded guilty but said she'd given the money to charities for starving children. Unfortunately, she was unable to provide any evidence in support of this claim. Bunty McSkimming was sentenced to 220 hours of community service. She should have been sent to jail. But she wasn't, and there you are. So she's still walking the streets of Glasgow. Mrs. McSkimming declined our invitation to take part in this program. The tree lovers did not give up. Bunty was declared bankrupt and she lost her home. To this day, no one has the faintest idea where the tree lovers' £84,000 really did go. Maybe it's all buried somewhere up in the highlands. Under a stone somewhere. <laughs> Down in Basildon, Sid Cheney's been continuing his life of crime. But after years of getting off scot free, Sid has been prosecuted. Dumped 5,000 pounds on the America Express. They demanded 10,000 pounds, 5,000 pound interest. I went to the court quite openly and admitted it all. And so America Express, when I told them, and they said, oh, you're Cheney, the one who's done the thing is, we don't want to get involved with you. So they sent me a card they sent me a card in which I have to pay a pound a week back for the next 230 years. So you pay a pound a week to American Express? <laughs> How much have you paid back? <laughs> um, pound a week. I paid, I checked it out, I've done about 55 pounds. In addition to justifying his thieving as part of his ongoing campaign against the banks, Sid, the self-styled Robin Hood of Basildon, has always maintained he's given away most of the money he has stolen. Can you honestly look me in the eye, Sid, and say that you've never had one little holiday or one flight? Yes, I had, a, I had a holiday, yes. And I'm looking you right in one of your eyes. I did. I went to Australia. The other one was to Las Vegas, where I went to the Jeanette McDonald Club, in which I'm uh, one of the leading members in England. Oh, I didn't buy nothing. No, no not really. And I'm looking in both your eyes now. The, the only things I kept was anything that I could sell, like uh, cigarettes or, or whiskey or something like that, which I used to sell for half price. I got that gain, but that was my expenses. Sue, so, I'm a really sound person, believe me. I wish that I could say to you, I'm a crook in some way. I'm not. I get offended even being called a crook. The only reason I think people might consider that you are a crook, Sid, is that really for the last 20 years you have been removing substantial quantities of money from many different banks and bank accounts? No, only the one, Barclays and the no, others. 
the, other, the others. From store cards from everybody. Oh, yes, well, I told you. Yes, that's true what you're saying. But uh, that was uh, only the reason I, I mentioned when I went down to see the directors of all the chairman of all the companies. What about all the store cards that you've taken money from as well? Store cards? I don't think mm. I had any store cards. What store cards were they? Debenhams. Oh, Debenhams, yes. Yes, that's true. Yes. Mm. I forgot about that, Debenhams. Having spent the last 20 years fighting for justice, or stealing depending on your standpoint, it doesn't look as though Sid is about to give up now. Are you quite proud of what you did? Yes. I'm proud. I'll do it again. I will do it again, believe me. So you're going to be a bad boy again, Sid? Really bad, yes. I'll even breathe it. I mean, my old day, that's what keeps me going. I'm sure it keeps me going. But then what have I got to lose? So it would appear that the bad boy of Basildon is still in business. After Charlie's last court appearance in November 2000, he said his thieving days were now over. He certainly seems to be slowing down. Ivy is on probation till September 2001. She hopes if she can go straight, she will one day get back together with her husband. Kenneth is still working two mornings a week at Help the Aged. John spent half his sentence in prison and the other half at home with a tag on his ankle. He remained on licence till March 2001. Bernard is keeping himself busy with his birds and his fishing, and has so far avoided the temptation to return to France. And Sid? Well, Sid's bags are packed and he's waiting to see whether he's going to Pentonville Prison or for an extended holiday to Australia. Do you think people watching this, I hate to say this to you, Sid, and forgive me for it, yeah. do you think they might just think you slightly got off your rocker? Well, maybe. Maybe they do, because they no disrespect to the viewers, but half of them don't know where they're coming or going anyway. <laughs> You want to go see them, and if that's what your criteria, your yardstick, you're putting me on, I think, hurry up, Sid, say farewell. Mm -hmm.